mentioned earlier, uh, I do uh, intend on uh, reading the sermon that I got from Kendall uh, earlier this week, but I think it would be inappropriate not to sprinkle in some of my own uh, thoughts uh, and not just solely pleasurize uh, his sermon. <laughs> this morning, um, in the young adults uh, Sunday school class, uh, David had brought up I think the term was procrastination. The, uh, the putting off until the very last minute to do something. And uh, I am certainly one of those people who throughout my life uh, was a master procrastinator. I uh, spent most of my childhood being fearful of almost everything uh, and waiting to the very last minute to do much of anything, whether it was schoolwork or any kind of activity that uh, required me to get in front of people and talk. Uh, or to do anything at all, because the fear of that would just be overwhelming. It would uh, sink in and haunt you, and, and more that you stewed on it, the worse it became. I haven't changed a whole lot as I've gotten older. I've realized that sometimes you have to face your fears, and you have to get up and do things, and once you do, it's, uh, it's normally not nearly as bad as you think it is. But uh, much like uh, what I did as a child, when Kendall asked me, or when I volunteered to, uh, to fill the pulpit a couple of weeks ago, uh, I too had full plans of waiting for the very last minute to do much of anything. So Kendall sent uh, a sermon uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was very kind about that. He told me I could use that or just about anything else that I could come up with. Uh, but he also probably could see inside my heart and knew that it might be best if you provide me some seed material to work from. <laughs> Uh, so I did. I, I took a moment. I decided I would uh, get out in front of my fears, and so I read through that sermon. It was about the washing of the feet, and, uh, and I thought, man, this is going to be great. I think I can do that. Service, washing of the feet, what a beautiful story for the second Sunday of Lent. And, uh, and then I read the scripture from the lectionary and realized that's not the right sermon. <laughs> so I'm not sure if it was Kendall paying a trick on me or God uh, forcing me to face my fears and, and be a little bit more proactive. And so I emailed Kendall and he sent me the right sermon. So <laughs> that's what we'll work from today. Um, so anyway, let's, uh, let's get started. As Betty had mentioned, uh, the story from John 11 is about Jesus and uh, Nazareth, and it is about um, the time where Jesus uh, is showing Mary and Martha and others um, his glory and his power in, in the final sign uh, before he heads on to Jerusalem. The other thing that we talked about this morning was, was time, and the time, uh, as God, God proposes, he talks about the 12 hours in the day, uh, and not stumbling if you do your work during that period of time. And I think, uh, for me, that means that while we have an opportunity, that we face those fears and we stretch out and we meet God's light out in the world, uh, because there will be a time when we pass from this world and we move on to the next uh, with God's grace. But we also notice that, that Jesus took four days. Uh, he took his time uh, going to see Lazarus, and he wasn't in a hurry. And for me, that tells me that God's timing uh, it's not only perfect, but it's certainly not my time. I would have been the person that would have run up there right away um, and then maybe procrastinated towards the end of it. Uh, but it, it does tell us something about Jesus' ways and, what, and the way that Jesus wants us to be. Uh, I said this in the Sunday school class, and, and I, I will attribute the quote to my boss, who is a good Christian man, and uh, he's been very patient with me, but he tells me that with people, slow is fast, and fast is slow. And what he means is you can't rush it. It's got to be the way it is, and I think that really comes straight from God. So I'm going to read to you Kendall's um, sermon, and I may sprinkle in a few comments here and there. Uh, I'll try not to, to uh, be too demeaning of our pastor. And when I'm done, I'm pretty certain you'll be glad to have him back. So. <laughs> The story of Lazarus being raised from the dead is both beautiful and terrible, which in a bizarre way makes a lot of sense to me. In many parts of our lives, the beautiful and the terrible seem to go together. For those of you who have had small children, 
or have them now, beautiful and terrible things are probably part of your everyday life. Often when checking Facebook, I see similar posts from parents with sick children. It's terrible, terrible that the children are ill and not feeling well. It's terrible that they cannot go to school or do other activities, so one or both parents have to juggle their schedules in order to stay at home with them while missing out on work and other commitments. But it is also an opportunity for beautiful moments of being able to sit on a couch or a bed and quietly cuddle with that child, making both you, both of you feel worlds better. On a more severe note, funerals can also be both beautiful and terrible. It is terrible to grieve the loss of a loved one, whether their death was expected or sudden, the grief can often be overwhelming. But then there is something beautiful about funerals as well. As Christians, we celebrate the completion of an individual's baptism, and we celebrate their life. People whom we may not have seen for many years gather, tell stories, share meals, and re reconnect all in tribute to the one who has recently passed on. Happiness and pain often go hand in hand. Both the movie and the play Shadowlands, the story of C.S. Lewis, and I'll stop there and ask, has anybody seen Shadowlands? It's a great movie if you ever had a chance to, to get it. Um, it's the story of C.S. Lewis and his wife, whom he had met later in life. Later in life. <clears throat> she ends up dying of cancer right rather soon after their marriage, and one of the underlying themes of the story addresses how suffering affects our lives. Near the beginning, Lewis says, You see, we are like blocks of stone out of which the sculpture carves forms of men. The blows of his chisel, which hurt so much, are what makes us perfect. This is a way of understanding suffering developed by one who had not suffered greatly. At the end of the tale, after losing his beloved wife, he says, I suppose some people would say we love to know we are not alone. Well, why love if losing it hurts so much? I have no answers anymore, only the life I have lived. Twice in that life I have been given a choice, as a boy and as a man. The boy chose safety. The man chooses suffering. Pain now is part of the happiness then. That's the deal. Life, like this story, can be both beautiful and terrible. Terrible in this context is clear. Jesus loves Lazarus and discovers that his dear friend is ill. When he finally makes it to Lazarus' home, he finds out that the one whom he loves is dead. What's more, both of Lazarus' sisters say to Jesus at one time or another, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. First Martha, and then later on, to really drive the point home, Mary says the same. It is clear that these women are conflicted. In their grief, they want to lay the blame of Lazarus' death on the Lord, but at the same time, they seem to feel some sort of angst about doing this. It's obvious they had a great deal of love and devotion for Jesus and are a bit hesitant at laying all the blame on their Lord. But at the same time, they hurt that Jesus did not intercede to save Lazarus. How many times have we, or someone we know, said, Lord, how could you let this happen? <laughs> It is a terrible moment in the story. Mary is weeping, the ones who are with them are weeping, and even Jesus is weeping. How much pain must Jesus have felt to weep? In his ministry, he has witnessed the wars inflicted by society on those who are poor, sick, possessed, marginalized, and yet, through all of that, the only time he weeps in the Gospel of John is here. It is a terrible moment, fraught with pain and grief. But there's beauty as well. 
Jesus here weeps not only because of the grief that he must be feeling, but primarily because Martha and Mary and all those who are mourning Lazarus are weeping too. Jesus is right there with them in their suffering. He doesn't offer them any pat on the, uh, any of the pat answers or empty phrases we are so quick to offer to those dealing with loss. He doesn't ask them silly questions, which we are prone to ask those who are grieving, like, how are you doing? You okay? He doesn't offer shallow comfort by saying things like, God just needed another angel. Instead of vainly trying to diminish their grief, he grieves with them. There is something beautiful and genuine in that. Real friends stand with us in our sorrow. They don't try to sweep it under the rug. They acknowledge the pain we are feeling. They say things like, I'm here. Even more powerfully, they say nothing at all and are just present with us. They cry when we cry. They hold us when we are shaking. And they even laugh when we laugh. That is the kind of friend Jesus is for Mary and Martha. I believe that is the kind of friend the Lord is to all of us. When we are struggling, he doesn't ignore us or try to minimize our suffering. He's just there with us. To me, that's beautiful. And then, after dealing with both the beautiful and the terrible, the day of resurrection comes. We don't know why Jesus calls Lazarus out of the tomb. We don't know why Jesus called only Lazarus and not others. But according to Scripture, it happened. And in this occurrence, I see grace. Grace that wasn't earned or deserved, but just pure and wonderful grace. This day of resurrection, this expression of grace comes in God's own time, not necessarily according to our schedules. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he waited two days before going to see him. When he arrived, Lazarus had been dead four days. And upon his arrival, Jesus did not go directly to the tomb, but takes the time to be with Martha and Mary, and then goes on to the tomb. This resurrection, as well as the one who will celebrate at the end of Lent, is a promise of grace that will happen, but will happen in God's own time. Frederick Buechner says, the grace of God means something like, here's your life. You might never have been, but you are because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here's the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen, and don't be afraid. The day of the resurrection will come, and praise be to God. Amen.